Hello, everyone. I'm Christy, and I'm with Padmini. We're both with the Asset Funders Network, and we're here today to talk about debt as a social determinant of health. This is based on our work through a series of briefs on the health wealth connection and various forms of debt and their impact on individuals. So let me tell you a little bit more about who the Asset Funders Network is. I'm a program officer and Padmini is a board member and we're a membership organization of grant makers who are advancing equitable wealth building and economic mobility. So I wanna start by getting us grounded on the health wealth connection. Health and wealth are inextricably linked and have a bi-directional influence on each other. We define wealth at the Asset Funders Network as assets minus debt. So debts are a significant portion of the wealth equation. And while many factors influence health, the most foundational are the socioeconomic factors, factors such as income, one's wealth, one's access to a safe neighborhood, one's freedom from racism and other factors. So let me say that debt does not make us well. In fact, it has a number of negative consequences based on research that we've done. So those with unaffordable debt have higher degrees of suicidality, are more likely to have depression and anxiety, are more likely to have high blood pressure, are more likely to be obese, um, and they're more at risk for having food insecurity and other kinds of, of insecurity around utilities and more likely to experience eviction. So having this unaffordable, uh, unaffordable debt not only affects our health and well-being, it actually affects our lifespan. Those with unaffordable debt live less long than those without debt. Yet, debt impacts people unevenly, as does wealth. There is a persistent wealth gap in our country. White households own eight times the amount of wealth as Black households and five times the amount as Latinx households. This is due to underlying structural inequities and racism that have you know, been part of this country since its founding. And that's the reason why these have persisted through the years. So closely related to the wealth gap is how debt affects people disparately. So on the next slide, I wanna spend a moment talking about debt and saying that debt is a pervasive part of our life. 70% of families in the United States hold some form of debt, but the amount, the type of debt and the impact of debt do impact people differently. And, if, and these are due to our inner, connected systems of justice, of education, of financial, of housing, and, and the like, and how those there are disparities built into those systems. And so if we just look at one form of debt for a moment, which is medical debt, uh, Black households are more likely to have medical debt in general, and also more likely to have medical debt that is past due. And this is due to disparities in income and in wealth and in access to health insurance. On top of that, debts tend to accumulate. So those with medical debt also are more likely to have legal debt and more likely to have student loan debt. All of that, all of that adds up to unaffordable debt that has those health consequences that I mentioned earlier. So it's pretty daunting. However, there are a number of ways that philanthropy can intervene to disrupt the, the debt problem that we see today. There, you can think of it as a continuum. So the first part of the continuum is to prevent debt from happening in the first place. And we can do so through supporting programs that provide people with resources such as income supports, health insurance, we can also invest in organizations and movements that are working toward debt re reform, particularly reform around municipal fines and fees, which disproportionately impact people of color. We can also provide support to individuals um, who already have debt, and we can do so through investing in financial coaching programs, credit counseling programs, 
and looking to employee benefit models where employers are helping people to reduce their debt loads and or provide relief from the debt. And then lastly, for those that already have debt and are experiencing harmful consequences, we can help with mitigation. We can contribute to debt relief funds such as the RIP Medical Debt and Medical Debt Freedom Fund. And we can also, again, invest in organizations and movements that are looking to reform debt litigation so that there's a more evenly distributed balance of power and more more um, appropriate supports for consumers, uh, more con appropriate consumer protections, I mean. Whatever strategy that philanthropy uses, it is important to use an equity lens to see who is most impacted by debt and which interventions would be most supportive to, to lessen those consequences. So now I wanna turn it over to Padmini, who's gonna talk about a pilot that she supported in San Francisco around unaffordable child support debt. Padmini? Thank you, Christy. My name is Padmini Parthasarathy, and I oversee economic security grant making at the Walter and Elise Haas Fund in San Francisco, California. I came into this work via a public health and health grant making career inspired by this strong relationship between wealth and health. So what and who do you think of when you hear the phrase child support? Is it so-called deadbeat dads who resist paying support to their families? Or do you imagine an essential system that helps keep children housed, clothed, fed, and ready for school? The truth is that both of these visions of the practical effects of California's child support system are based on misconceptions. The most common reality is quite different. For example, in California, 40% of child support payments instead go to pay off debt owed to the government. And this is how that happens. Child support orders are often unaffordable. Some parents have found that they owe child support debt to the government for public assistance their families received while they were providing informal support to their children. The state of California allows eligible non-custodial parents to pay 10% of their public assistance payback debt and eliminate their remaining government owed debt. But still, for some parents, even the partial payment is more that they can, than they can afford, and the application process is complicated and really hard to navigate. Secondly, if a non-custodial parent falls behind in their child support payments, California charges 10% annual interest on the overdue amount, causing the amount they owe to increase very quickly. In addition, penalties for paying late or stiff. If parents' payments are more than 30 days late, their driver's licenses can be suspended, their professional licenses may be revoked, and the state can garnish up to half of their take-home pay and seize other financial assets. In some cases, up to 65% of the non-custodial parents' take-home pay can be garnished if the local child support agency pursues it through the courts. So parents end up choosing between repaying child support to the government and supporting their children. High payments lead some parents to feel they must choose between paying formal child support, which amounts to repaying the government for public assistance benefits paid to their children and supporting their children directly. Many non-custodial parents feel the paradox that repaying child support to the government diminishes their financial capacity to provide for their children. Next slide. What are the effects of the child support payback problem? Research shows that government owed child support debt creates barriers to successful employment, positive family relationships, and self-sufficiency. And not surprisingly, that when parents support their children financially and spend time with them, children benefit in the short and long term. Research also shows that when a child receives money through child support, the transfer may have a greater effect than other sources of family income on their school performance and behavior, indicating that it is meaningful to children that the support comes from a parent. And studies show that when a child support payment goes directly to their children, parents are more likely to pay support. Changes to federal laws and rules over the past two decades have given states increased flexibility to reform their child support programs to better serve low-income families. For example, a 2016 rule change requires states to more carefully consider parents' ability to pay when establishing child support orders and before incarcerating parents for failure to pay. A 2006 law gave states the option to pass all child support payments to families and eliminate some older debt. 
So recently, when Colorado eliminated public assistance payback requirements and began giving families all of the support paid on their behalf, the total amount of child support payments increased by 63% in the first year of implementation. Next slide. This public assistance payback policy has disproportionate effects on low-income families and people of color. It is both a racial justice and economic justice issue, as well as a health equity issue. Families in San Francisco experiencing the consequences of child support debt began sharing their challenges with the San Francisco Financial Justice Project, housed in the city's treasurer's office, asking them to do something to address this issue. Like many of us, the staff had never heard about this debt issue before. As they investigated and recognized the multiple challenges this policy creates, they knew they had to act. So the Financial Justice Project, the state of California, the local child support agency in San Francisco and their philanthropic partners decided to collaborate to help low-income parents paying child support in San Francisco eliminate their public assistance payback debt. Next slide. So my foundation paid down the portion of the participants debt, 10%, that was needed to eliminate their remaining debt according to state policy. Through this approach, the pilot participants ended up receiving full debt relief. The debt relief pilot was offered to all parents with current child support obligations in San Francisco who met the following criteria. They resided in the Bay Area, owed between $550,000 and $50,000 in government owed child support debt, were making some effort to meet their debt obligations, had a current child support obligation, and the custodial parents formerly, re formerly received but were not currently receiving cash assistance through CalWORKs, which is California's Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. Pilot participants were required to attend a four-hour financial coaching workshop and were expected to stay current on child support payments to their children for at least one year. 32 parents met these criteria and voluntarily agreed to participate in the pilot to have their government-owed child support debt eliminated. Moving forward, 100% of any payments made by the pilot participants started going to their families, as long as they remained current on their payments. This pilot provided an opportunity to test the effect of this debt relief on participating parents. Next slide. So with the support, from Tipping Point Community, another Bay Area funder, Urban Institute evaluated this pilot, looking at the debt relief's effect, effects on the parents' employment, financial stability, compliance with current child support orders, relationships with their children, and other aspects of well being. Next slide. The stories of focus group participants illustrated how the debt relief transformed their experiences from ones of debt, despair, and missed opportunities to improved well being for parents and children. The debt relief not only eliminated the parents' debt, for many focus group participants and survey respondents, it also lifted the considerable stress associated with the debt. And we know that stress is likely one of the pathways that allows financial security to get under the skin and contribute to poor health outcomes. As the participants said, the relief program made me see at the end of the tunnel, there will be a better life for me and my kids. I felt more free, like I was starting a new beginning in life, like life was starting over for me. I've just been more happy, more able to think a little bit more breathe more. Parents also reported improved credit scores, improved employment and housing status, increased feelings of control over their finances, improved relationships with their children and co-parents, and a better relationship with the child support system itself. We know from the decades of literature on the social determinants of health that these outcomes likely contributed positively to the health of both parents and children. In addition, with most of the affected families being people of color and those living with low incomes, we know that this is a true health equity issue. The dramatic results of this pilot have also led to progress on state policy change in California. On May 11, 2020, a new statewide coalition called Truth and Justice in Child Support launched with more than 50 organizations, including the San Francisco Financial Justice Project. 
The launch included a three minute video that brings awareness to this problem, which the Walter and Elise Haas Fund supported. The short called Everything You Think You Know About California Child Support Is Wrong was narrated by W. Kamau Bell and Robert Reich and it advanced the coalition's call for 100% of all parents' child support payments to go to their children. This video will be available to you to view in the conference resources. And there are several pieces of legislation on deck this year to reform child support in California. For example, the current proposed 2021-2022 state budget would increase child support passed through to the family from $50 to $100 for the first child and $200 for two or more children and continue redirecting the rest of each month's child support payments to the state, county, and federal governments. It would also stop charging 10% interest on child support debt owed and eliminate uncollectible government owed child support debt. They're still even more needed, but this would be a great start. As you've heard today, philanthropic dollars can be used to test ideas that can lead to permanent broad reform. I wanna share with you a few recommendations and actionable ideas for funders such as yourselves. So first recommendation is to invest in work on the ground, including pilots and their evaluations. If you're a local funder, a smaller funder, or only fund more direct service type work, this can be a practical strategy. Our grant to the pilot was $40,000, a relatively small investment for the significant impact the pilot has had, as I've shared today. Second recommendation is that you can support policy change efforts. More funding is always needed for public policy efforts to put what we've learned about child support and other debt issues from work on the ground into action. Advocacy work is important as are related organizing, research, and communication strategies. For example, the research conducted about the child support debt pilot garnered good media attention that helped influence policy change in California. Collaborating across sectors is also key. The issue of child support debt is an opportunity for funders of many different kinds to engage and other types of debt as well. You may be listening to the session today because you consider yourself a health funder, but you may also be a funder focused on children's health or education or on racial justice or on gender justice. You all have a part to play in lifting up this critical issue. And last but definitely not least, is to listen to people affected and center them in the solutions. This pilot happened because it was affected parents who told the Financial Justice Project that this was an issue. Families affected by child support debt and the relief of that debt have the most important expertise and solutions to contribute to fixing this challenge and other similar challenges. And I'm gonna add one more here that's not listed on the slide. It's building relationships. Part of why the fund, the Walter and Lee's Haas Fund, was willing to take a chance on this pilot was because it already had a strong relationship with the Financial Justice Project from getting to know them while funding their core work to eliminate inequitable fines and fees. I encourage you to think about your existing relationships and also who else you wanna to get to know that might help you make change. For more information about the child support debt work in San Francisco and in California, work in other states, and more information about how funders can support health wealth connection strategies more broadly, please check out the resources that will be provided to you by GIH for this session. Next slide. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I hope that you've gained insights that are relevant to your work and inspire you to join this fight to address inequitable debt and its impact on health equity. Our hope in sharing this information about debt as a social determinant of health and the case study of the child support debt pilot in San Francisco is that we can help build a movement to address inequitable debt across the country.